This is the stuff dreams are made of. I'm writer collector Ryan Condal, and I'm writer collector Dave Mandel. Uh, hey Ryan, how you doing? Hey Dave, you really you swallowed that water just yes. perfectly in time to be able to hit hit your beat. That's that's the mark of a very, true very broadcasting proud. professional. Yes, exactly. I've been hearing. Your uh, I don't know. I've been listening to some other podcasts, and you start to hear these people who have like built booths in their houses you know like like actual like like yeah. soundproof kind of whatever i guess where you don't hear a hooper barking and whatnot but uh i, I don't know we'll see maybe in my world, maybe in my next house i'll just spend yeah. like a hundred thousand dollars building a state-of-the-art sound booth you just a closet this, yeah just for this show <laughs> i think just for this show and no other work and nothing else like, very just, good yeah. Uh, yeah just for this show. no i mean yeah. i have to say credit to ourselves like we really do go through an effort to produce this show i mean the show is well produced thank you thank you bart taylor uh who does our, our, our yeah i feel and... like we could easily not do the sound mix step and just sort of force you to listen to it unsound mixed and yeah. uh and by the way for a long time uh and this is really the first season where with we're you not screaming of, and me barely right, whispering yeah, yeah. With, with us like this is the first time we're like not out of pocket uh thank you to our sponsor yes, uh, heritage auctions yeah. uh yeah. for <laughs> actually paying for the sound mixes and stuff uh because we have just been uh it has it, we're always been behind and a little bit as they say in the red um but uh i don't know it drives me crazy when i listen to a podcast and it's like you know, one guy uh, clearly like not on a good mic and, you know, no, I don't know. It makes me crazy. Yeah. It, it's really crazy. And we do, we do make an effort. I mean, I think, you know, yes, the next step would be actual proper recording booth, but we have all the right equipment. We do, you know, we take the pains it's, it's mixed. Paul Terry, uh, your job is safe, Paul. Don't worry. We're not, we're not, uh, unmixing this. Um, uh, just, you know, thank you to him, he and Bart who do very hard work behind the scenes to make the sound great, but it drives me crazy too. And it like, my thing is if you're going to make the effort to do this thing, it is actually Actually, it doesn't cost a lot of money to get no. like a good mic. And yes, okay, maybe the sound mix and whatever. But we, you know, we record through this browser-based uh, recording studio called Riverside, and uh, it's just it's brought not, to you by Riverside. Yeah, yeah that's right. We, it's we pay it's for just that not too. that much yeah. effort. And then there's a there is a um, as you know, Dave, one of my side interests. Um, uh, close to one of your side interests, your monkey radiator caps. I like the things that the monkey radiator caps go on, which is the car beneath it. The what? <laughs> and, yeah, actually, you wouldn't believe it. You would not believe it. But those are actually just ornamentations to these four wheeled vehicles that people enjoy to drive and collect. And um, and uh, there's a there's a car collecting podcast that I really enjoy the content of, but I find it very difficult to listen to. Uh, the by this very famous, like one of the most well known car journalists in the world, Chris Harris, and it's just four dudes on like a Zoom session screaming into their MacBooks right. without microphones, and it's it's cr it's cross garbled <laughs> and all that, and it's like guys, you know, you're you're actually a broadcasting professional, right? By the freaking microphone, it's it dry it drives me nuts. But um, also, so what's much this podcast pod about, Dave? So, I know, but so much of podcasting <laughs> is just sort of like relatively, in the grand scheme of you know, sort of socioeconomic uh, existence, better to do people dilettantes deciding to spend some of their time, you know, yabbing to talk about this stuff. So just buy your mics. We know you can afford the mics. I mean, again, if you're, if you're recording in the streets, so be it. But you know, it's just like, if you sort of make a living, like a, a good living in another field and have decided to just podcast for the hell of it, like us, buy a mic, buy a decent mic. At it's least just buy not, the that, mic. not yeah. that hard. Yeah. Not yeah. that hard. So yeah. You can uh, sound as good as yeah. the stuff dreams are made of. You're listening to Audio World, uh, the yes. new all audio criticism, podcast criticism website. So, this yeah, is in our you. attempt to become more niche and less listenable and downloadable. We are now just talking about. You know what I dream podcasts. of? I dream of people sound mixing properly and buying mics. That's what those are. The, yeah. That's the uh, stuff I dream of. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> um, uh, what's new in props? Uh, what's new in props? Uh, what is new in props? Um, I think I mentioned at some point uh, winning an auction, uh, but they arrived somewhere in the last uh, since, I don't know, somewhere in there, which is I picked up something I had wanted very much so, which is a uh, a call sheet from uh, Chinatown, which I oh, was nice. really, really uh, just excited to get for all the reasons you can imagine. Um, you know, th that is a tough movie to have a prop from that isn't a costume. You know what I mean? And right. while I love the costumes, it just... I'm not sure I'm ever going to own, you know, JJ Giddis's, you know, 
jacket. Do you know what I mean? Right. Or hat or whatever. I'd love a sign or a card that said Giddis Investigations or something like that. But I ended up with a call sheet uh, and I, I just, I love it. Not, you know, and again, in the grand scheme of collecting, not too much money, uh, but it's a 1973 September, uh, sorry, November 7th, 1973. I'm taking a peek at it. Uh, producer, Robert Evans, uh, director, right. Roman Polanski, Chinatown. It's a couple of scenes uh, at El, uh, at Mulray's house, uh, Evelyn Mulray's oh, nice. house. Uh, it's uh, Giddis, the butler, uh, and the gardener. So I think it's the one where the James gardener... Hong? Uh, Hot Hong is the butler, yeah, and uh, I don't know, know the name of the gardener, but I think it's where the gardener. It's an exterior shot in the backyard. I think oh, it might be the one where he says "salt water" with the glasses. Yeah, and stuff, yeah, yeah. I think so. Oh, that's uh, that's, that's a key pretty scene. cool. Yeah, so I I I'm really excited just to uh, get it, and uh, and it even has on it for the next day. Uh, John Houston's going to be working the next day. So I, I just, it's a, it's a great call sheet. It looks like there was probably a second page with a map or something on it. It's just mm. the, the first page front and back. Uh, there's a, you know, a missing staple and whatnot. I don't care. It's a little slice of perfect. And uh, I was just very That's excited great. to grab it. Uh, you know, on, I think I've said this before, but I will say it again on a lot of these sort of, you know, classic great movies, I have really made an effort to try and sort of, you know, I've been lucky enough to have one uh, from uh, Some Like It Hot and a bunch of other great, uh, you know, Apocalypse Now, The Godfather, just call sheets from these movies I absolutely love where in some cases, I don't know, I don't have a prop or maybe I have something, but I love having this sort of piece of the movie history. So yeah, uh, I, I just a, a real fan of it. So yeah, yeah, that that's awesome. I actually, I, I, I admit I, I, I got very uh, jealous of your call sheet collection and uh, also fellow collector and former guest and friend of the podcast, Glenn Carroll, yes. uh, who has this amazing call sheet collection. He has actually, an incredible one. And I've actually, I should say, and uh, when he was on the show, it may have come up. He's the one that I believe hooked me up with the Some Like It Hot one, which is just a uh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. like he, was, he had two and was able to give me one which nice. was beyond fabulous. Nice. Very so, yeah. cool. So thank yeah, you, Glenn, he, um, for listening. He uh he he brought out uh, we we got together for the the prop store auction. He brought out um his call sheet uh like kind of the 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 best of his call sheet collection. Oh, wow. and it's actually very cool. He keeps them in those um comic art portfolios that you guys sure. use. Um so you can and just sort just of turn the page of back the page call page, sheets. Yeah. And they're very elegantly presented. He has them sort of, you know, he has like a label on the spine to tell you, you know, however he's cattle. I don't remember how he was sort of, you know, this is the 1930s, the 1940s. I forget how he was doing it. But he had, I mean, the you know, just movies that you can't get stuff from. He had call sheets right. from, and it was just so fun to page through and see what scene that was shooting that day. And I, it made me, you know, the, the collector gear goes and <laughs> goes into action in your head. And I was like, oh, I need a call sheet collection, um, which I, I really don't, but I, I, I was, I was very charmed by it. So, um, so good on you, Dave. That's, a, that's uh, a very- like I said, I think they really, I don't have enough to like put them in a book, but I have a couple of them framed and I just love the way they kind of, look on the wall even though being in the business there's sort of nothing worse than your call you know like like oh god 6 a.m tomorrow but i guess yes, when it's not it creates anxiety it's not when it's not your own call sheet yeah. they're pretty they're pretty nice yeah. yeah it does make me wish i'd held on to more call sheets from stuff i worked on although these days so much of it is digital but yeah anyway, yeah no. yeah so i have i have a what's new props but it's, it's a it's a dilemma and i was hoping for your help on it all right go for uh, it so i have been offered a uh a set basically a set of hudson bdus uh from aliens and i um i i as you know i have uh i have and we should just say for those that don't specifically know this is referring basically to what i guess uh you would more commonly call sort of the the camouflage uh sort of uh the cloth clothing that they wear They're, they're soldiers' uniforms under the colonial they're Marines underpants, armor, essentially. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, it's a basic duty uniform. I think is yes. what is what that stands for. But yes, the camos, and um, it's it's a jacket, and uh, it's 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 labeled Bill Paxton. Uh, it's got uh, Hudson on on the uh, on the on the breast. Um, it has the uh, Sulaco patch. Uh, it's missing a couple of the other patches, which is the, the one thing that bothers me. The only other thing that bothers me is that it's long sleeved, and Hudson in the film has wears those very kind of 
whether they're short sleeves or they're just heavily rolled, it's a little unclear. And um, I was just, I'm, I'm sort of like, how do you value something like this? You know, I think I've been, I, I don't think he wants the, the moon for it, which is a good place to go. And I'm just sort of deciding like, yes, in a, an ideal world, it would be very nice to have that under my armor. Although I quite like the way my armor is displayed because, because it's just the armor, you can see into it. You can so see you can through see it and into it. No, I understand The Hudson that. label agree, yeah. and everything. So I've sort of been well, by the way, you backing could and pick, forthing. You could pick these up and quote quote unquote, hold on put to up, it put them for away. now and put them away and reevaluate if someday you're able to also find the pants and boots sure. and whatnot. If all of a sudden you decide to move along from kind of a torso display to a to larger full yeah. figure display, but yeah. it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, back when I had armor, and originally, I had mismatched BDUs under my armor, and then I was able to acquire slowly, piece by piece, Hicks uh, top and then pants. It was oh, sort nice. of it was all very piecemeal and separate. They are obviously together in some cases, but they're also often very separate and very mismatched because I think yeah. in the early days of the BDU collecting. I don't know. It's like people weren't paying attention to like, especially like I think in the pants, like whose pants were whose, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think the possibility of pants showing up by themselves, I mean, I know this is a sort of a larger conversation, but I think pants by themselves is certainly a possibility. And as you said, sure. as long as they're not sort of, you know, asking for the moon, I sort of feel like it's worth grabbing. Can I ask a question about the missing patches? Yeah. Is there a sense at all that they were there? Is there any stitching or anything that indicates they were there and are gone? It's or hard just to tell. never there? Hard yeah, to tell. Yeah, it's hard okay, to tell. The curious. jacket is pretty clean, not in a disturbing way, but there are others that are like the, the, the my favorite set that I've seen, which it does have the chopped sleeves. You can tell that one's been used. Right. It's been through the war um, re in a really good way. And, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I suppose there's a chance that could become available at some point, too. Well, so I guess that was that would be my one the, big question is, do you think there's any chance of making a move on that or not? Not at the moment, so to probably speak. Probably not at the moment. That, that, yeah, that sort of thing. Nor do I think I do. I want it that badly to right. You know, quite yet. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I guess what I would say is, if if you can live with the world of what the number is and make the deal, I would grab it because what I would argue is because it's Hudson. You know, you're not like you not know, with 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 all. I guess with no offense, I should say to Frost or anyone else. You know, if it were like Frosts, you know, it's like yeah, someone might buy them. Do but, not speak you know, ill of Rico Ross. Dave. Yeah, exactly. But you know what I'm kind of saying in the sense of like, I think someone will always want the Hudson BDUs, even if they're not a yeah. Hudson collector per se. Yeah, I think they'll always be sort of an aliens. Forgive me, market. So as long as you're getting it at a half decent price and not you know a you know, a back breaking and bank breaking price. I say grab it and just sort of play it out. It's it's OK just to sort of stick it in a garment bag and just put it in the closet for now and sort of reevaluate when and if pants and like the leg, you know, the greaves and whatnot show yeah. up. You know, you can I think you can play this one out because it's not it's not going to destroy your wallet. That's my yeah. my overall yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, that's fair. Yeah. Um, all right then. Well, thank you. I think, yeah. um, I think that helps me, uh, make, make the decision. Um, so we have a very exciting guest tonight. I, I don't yeah, want this to, is pretty uh, special. Yeah. uh, delay this any longer, uh, kind of a coup for the podcast. And, uh, we were, we were, we were both surprised to get him and surprised at how actually eager he was to talk about us. This is an interview. I think this is the first thing we recorded this season because we were so excited to get him that we just took him while he was available. It was always a bit of a time zone issue to get everything lined up because that this was our first true three time zone me in podcast. la you in london and him in new zealand new zealand a, yeah, yeah if you can guess where what movie franchise this might be from so tonight we uh we have uh the great uh swordsmith and master sword maker peter lyon who built uh, all of these uh, hero swords and you know, kind of helped in the design with uh, John John Lee and uh, sorry John Howe and Alan Lee, Alan Lee uh, yep. in the uh, both the original Lord of the Rings trilogy and then the Hobbit trilogy is now an employee of Weta uh, has been there for you know now a quarter of a century you know banging on the anvil and making swords and I you know I've been a Peter Lyon fan 
uh, for a long time because I was into this stuff and the swords and the, and the props and everything. So I kind of knew his name even before the movies came out because there was all that pre news as to who was working on the films. And he had a, he had a, a swordsmithing website out of New Zealand. So you could kind of see the material that he worked on and get a sense of his, uh, uh design sensibility and things like that. Uh, so to, to be, I met him a couple of years ago at Comic-Con, which, uh, which he probably doesn't remember, but, uh, but we hit it off because we were, we were talking about swords and then uh he's actually a huge conan fan so learning that i had one of the original jody Sampson blades he was very excited about that because that was one that you know he had tried to recreate kind of early in his sword making career and we talked about that i sent him photos and we exchanged emails and whatever so that's i was able to thus later and now in now that we have a podcast track him down and ask him if he's willing to come on the podcast he was he was excited he was a great interview great to chat so without further ado let us bring on Mr. Peter Lyon. Thanks for having me on. Peter, I get to say something I never thought I would get to say, which is I feel <laughs> like you're like the, at this point, the fifth like swordsmith I've met. I mean, this is a very, <laughs> yeah. I never, <laughs> it, when I, as a child, yeah. I never thought I'd meet any, let alone one or two. And <laughs> yeah. here we are with like number five or six, yeah. or I'm very excited. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, thanks. Hi. <laughs> yeah, there's a few of us around these days. It's a very funny thing. We're moving very forward in terms of our technology, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, self-driving cars and whatnot. Yeah. But somewhere along the way, swordsmiths mm. made a comeback, which is uh, probably good for the coming apocalypse yeah. and whatnot. So, yeah. <laughs> Are you prepared? Let me start with this is my first question. Are you prepared to make the move from film props to like people need swords to defend their homes like in another like Not really. year and a half well, okay. you, should, uh, you might want to gear up <laughs> well, that's actually a really interesting topic in itself one of the things that makes me happy to be a swordsmith is that the sword is an obsolete weapon like i actually would be horrified if i was selling a sword to somebody that i thought might actually use it to hurt another person because i i, I make function I make fully functional swords, but at the same time, I want them to be art pieces. Like, I don't want my creations to be killing people. But And also, we've really got to admit that who's who apart from an idiot or a crazy person is going to go into a fight with a sword these days in a world that's full of guns? All I can tell you is, as we are speaking right now, uh, uh, Hurricane Hillary is hitting mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles, California. And I think yep. if it goes on for another hour, people are going to take to their to the streets with swords. <laughs> I mean, people yeah. have lost their minds here. So oh, I'm just kind of saying you like that. prepare, yeah. Yeah. prepare oh, yeah. for uh, yeah. today's art piece is tomorrow's like, I'm going to kill my neighbor and take their uh, smart yeah. water. And, it, and so. I've heard an old mantra that we're something like, three to five days away from 21st century civilization to um, eat your neighbor. Yeah. I'm not it's sure like, it's that many like, days. I think it's about a day and a half. Yeah. I'm very excited today. I mean, I know, you know, I, I'm, you know, Peter, his work uh, has always been a um, uh, on kind of on my radar. I mean, since I it really, since I, I can remember paying attention to, the art of movie making and what what kind of goes on be, behind the scenes and you know I've probably known Peter's name for like twenty five years now because I was I followed the um, I was a big uh, Tolkien fan uh, growing up the you know reading uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and some Merlin and all that so I followed the making of um, the New Line uh, movies uh, back in the late nineties very closely even when they were kind of off the radar of everybody but the craziest Tolkien nerds. So I think I knew, I probably knew your name even before sort of popular culture knew your name when the movies came out mm -hmm. and where the splash they were because I was so excited about them. And I was, I grew up obsessed with swords as we know from from uh, anybody that listens to this podcast, but particularly the, you know, the, the famous swords of, um, of, of Middle Earth, so Glamdring and uh, Anduril and, and Narsil and Sting. And those, those were all, uh, those were all objects that I had uh, images of in my, in my mind. And I was so excited to see um, what you guys were going to do with them. And now I, now I would say as in compliment, I think the, the things that you, uh, you made Peter have now those images have replaced the images that existed <laughs> in my mind of yeah. from probably from the, the 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 you know my imagination but also the the artwork of yeah. um you know alan lee and john mm -hmm. howe and ted nasmith and um 
the the many famous artists that you know had, yep. had drawn Tolkien before Peter Jackson brought it to mm-hmm. life on on the screen. So Peter, I'm very excited books, to have you. Peter, were those books important to you? Were those books of your childhood, so to speak? I've got to admit that I only read Lord of the Rings once before um, I caught the work on Lord of, on the movies, and uh, that was when I was a teenager, and I actually wasn't that impressed by it. <laughs> I've got to, I hate to admit it. Yeah, I'm afraid so. We've got like, our headline. We've got I our headline. It, I found it. Oh yeah, I found it pretty heavy going in places, and I skip all the all the uh, singing and poetry bits. But um, it's really Get interesting the about the way that those swords have defined the look of you know of Tolkien's swords. Because okay, first of all, everyone thinks oh Tolkien really really described his swords well. Actually, no, he didn't. <laughs> His descriptions are really evocative, but they're terrible descriptions. It's like it's got a jeweled hilt. Okay, cool. That's it. That's the description. So um, the the artists, and particularly John Howe and Alan Lee, got so obviously had a lot of scope, and we benefited from the time that we were doing this too, because this was before uh, 3D modeling and 3D printing. So these days. A sword would be fully defined, and in fact, I may only see components after they've been printed or machined these days. But back in those days, they were still drawing with pen and uh, pencil and paper, not on a screen. And I was given drawings, and I was given a bit of leeway to interpret them as real swords, with proportions and how they'd they'd work in three dimensions as you. So there were things in their designs where you looked at them and kind of had to say to yourself. Yes, but or this hmm. needs to yeah. be a little bit more like be, yeah yeah like this is a beautiful elegant cross but it's so spindly that it would never actually survive so just make it a little chunkier, um, and we also benefited from the fact that the swords had to be made for real. Admittedly, with modern tooling and machines to speed up the process, but they're actually made as real swords, not as film props, and that is something that I worry is is being lost these days because so yeah. much stuff is completely 3D modeled by people who are good 3D modelers, but they don't know swords. And so we get a process where swords are props rather than swords. And I, I had the advantage coming from a medieval reenactment background that I looked at a sword as a sword first and a prop second. So I was looking at weight balance, um, and stuff like that, as well as the artistic thing of how does it look in three dimensions when you turn it in your hand and things like this. And I think that the film benefited from that because as you see these, you see that they're real weapons, just blunt, because you hand an actor a sword and suddenly they're a swordsman. <laughs> and you know, um, they want to wave it around and it's like, yeah, not sharp. <laughs> but, but yeah, we actually did benefit from the time period and in a way, each period of filmmaking is a time capsule. So you don't do things today the way that we did 25 years ago, for better or worse. Was it different, if you don't mind me asking, when you guys got to the Hobbit films, because even that Mm -hmm. was a little bit later, was it, was it different or were you guys still, if you will, doing it the way you did it? It it was a bit different. There's um, the work, people that don't know the film industry, the work gets split out among different departments because if every, say in The Hobbit, we were on quite a time crunch because Peter Jackson picked up the reins and redefined things in the way he wanted it to look. So that meant we were on a real time crunch to get everything made. And so it would have been impossible to make every sword as a real sword. So there was a lot more 3D modeling, printing, CNC machining and things like that involved. But some hero props like Orcrist and a few others were handmade in our department. And so we were, again, at a, a new point in the evolution where we had these other tools available and we had to use them because otherwise we were never going to get it done. But there was still quite a lot of handmade swords in there or aspects that were done by hand and that was still fun stressful but fun but fun i uh speaking of uh, like every actor gets a sword and is a swordsman i was sort of reading in your bio uh you kind of came out of a little bit of like the i don't know it was the word reenactment or how, yep. and, and and certainly i i saw that you used to joust among other mm-hmm. things yep. and and yep. obviously uh swung a sword um were you did you have any involvement with the actors in terms of handing them the sword and ever saying sort no, of no really. like no that was completely no, its own separate no, that was thing. that okay. was other departments 
so yeah, I, I did interact with lead actors and people like that when they were getting fittings and trying things out. And and those were the days too, which is sounds really weird now, where during Lord of the Rings, it was a lot of it was surprisingly casual. Like I remember one day I was on the phone, Christopher Lee walks in and I just wave at him. It's like, oh, hi, Christopher. <laughs> and off he goes. It's like, can you imagine that in uh, other bits of the world? Yeah, you know, like day off, they just come wandering into the where to workshop and just see what's new. Um, that's great. It was a great way to do things, and I didn't only learned afterwards that that's not how the real world works. <laughs> Christopher Lee has never casually walked through my office, but uh, that's uh, that is an amazing uh, part of filmmaking. The yeah. surprises oh, that come yeah, every day. Yeah. So, um, Peter, I, we do, we obviously want to talk so a lot about Lord of the Rings. Did we get sidetracked a bit there? Yeah, we, no, this entire this is, podcast this... is a giant sidetrack. <laughs> well, no you were asking yes. about my, my reenactment background, so I might as well mention a bit about that. And yeah, I started off in right. medieval reenactment. And you've got to remember, New Zealand is on the opposite side of the world from the history that we were trying to recreate. So we got a very skewed view of what was happening in the rest of the world at around about, you know, 1984 when I started and um, like we got very little information no internet of course and so when we did see photos we we saw the best of what people were doing because they were the ones that got in the books and so that was sort of the the thing that I saw was the target to aim for so I always had a set a high standard whether I could achieve it or not reenactment in New Zealand was um, a little bit ropey at times <laughs> um, I mean, uh, it, it, if we had Ren fairs in New Zealand, we would have fitted in pretty well. Uh, but eventually um, the jousting came about because a friend of mine, Callum Forbes, was getting into the horse side of things. And if anyone involved with horses knows that horses just dominate your life. And it's a very good way to become a millionaire when you started with two million. <laughs> like. It's the classic story. How do you become a millionaire? You start with $2 million and then you keep horses. <laughs> and But anyway, so he actually was really into the jousting. I managed to latch on to that. Um, he gave me the advantage of never actually having the expense and time overheads of uh, having my own horse. And I got into the jousting that way because it was the next logical step in a way. It's like to understand what was going on. And you get on a horse and the world changes a lot. Like horses get a bit more complicated. Um, you're on this big animal that you're trying to work with while you're doing other stuff. So armor and lance and things like that. You add that on to riding a horse. And it's a creature that's run by a very small brain and mostly instinct. So there are definitely challenges there. But uh, at its Wait, best, are we joust talking jousting about jousting? was amazing. Are we talking about jousting or movie making? I'm sorry, small brain. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, could sorry. be crossovers. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, jousting, jousting was the most amazing, stressful, uh, focused thing that I think I could do. Like the the you're about two seconds between perfection and disaster at any moment. Uh, and I'm not just talking about when you strike with the lance. I'm talking about just riding. <laughs> like sure. I've seen horses just decide I'm going sideways, boom, and leave the rider behind and stuff like that. Because I feel like Ryan, you've recreated jousts, right? You've got jousting in your. Have you done jousting per se yet in in a show or not quite yet? Yeah, yeah, and the in the in the oh, pilot, you, you've done had, jousting. Yeah, yeah. We had so a turn. We had a turn. Done like fake jousting, and mm. that must be hard enough. But the idea of being on a horse and actually jousting, yeah, well, yeah, just we seems had, insane. Yeah, yeah, we had we had a pretty gnarly um accident with i mean thankfully they were they were stunt guys and he's he's fine now but um as you know as peter said uh inches between you know uh inches and seconds between uh success mm. and disaster and uh you really uh, like the experience that i had watching that you know standing on the ground watching it be, being filmed was you realize how dangerous a weapon the horse was in medieval mm. warfare and just the terror that somebody must have felt with not only yeah. one horse riding at you but, but you imagine <laughs> a, a cavalry line you know coming out of the trees and come bearing yeah. down on the foot soldiers and that's why everything would you know yeah. usually go to hell at that point because just the horror of seeing these armored you know mm. armored <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 900 yeah. pound I've, beast 1100 pound beast you know yeah. riding down I've, on you at 30 I've, miles an hour i've had the i've had the experience of um somebody on the ground filming us rushing at them and my instruction to him was don't move basically if you move 
you may move into the horse because I'm going to leg yield past you at the last moment. So sure. even if it looks like I'm about to run you over, stay still. It's like, it can be so dangerous. And then of course, for you, Ryan, you've got the extra complication. You're trying to think framing, movement, all panning, all this stuff. You're trying to you're trying to actually get a shot as well as doing everything. So telling a story. Yeah, so many yeah. challenges. Yeah. You started medieval reenactment. Were you had you been messing around with blacksmithing before that, or did no. this get you into that work? The, this got me into it. So I, I was at university and met a guy who was with a one of our very early sword fighting groups, which was actually an offshoot of um, of uh, stage combat for plays and things. Okay. Okay. And that got me into it. And so I just kept going deeper and deeper. So before uh, that, it there was it wasn't like you were forgive me reading books or any kind of like you weren't like swords were meaningless. I mean they were they were swords. They were yeah, whatever yeah. they were. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I I was reading history and fantasy, um, but I didn't I didn't, wasn't actually wanting to get into medieval reenactment until I saw it and I thought yeah I, I want to have a go at this. It's also um, one of these weird things. I'm very likely autistic. Like I learned a few years ago, I did one of these tests and I was like, ah, ah, that explains a lot. <laughs> like it wasn't like I was freaked out. It was just like, okay, now I understand why I was a weird kid. Um, I'd, Peter, I'd like to, I'd like to introduce you to every comedy writer in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, yes. yeah, and most maybe, collectors, but, yeah, maybe, but like, maybe the, not the, with the swords, but otherwise, yeah. 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 Okay. But the, um, you know, the obsessive focus that goes with that. And I just picked mm. on medieval stuff as my obsession and uh, everything sort of grew from there. So how, well, okay. So how did you find your way into, was it, was it, I, I, I'm, I've had my time in the joust and I need to find something a little safer or was it simply yeah. just the, the, you know, the, the weapons here aren't realistic enough. What what was it that drove you into um, the interest in, in swordsmithing? Uh, well, actually, it was the reenactment. And, of course, again, like I said, 1980s New Zealand, we couldn't get anything. Um, like one of our prized possessions was a, a one-sheet uh, thing from a, a helmet maker in England at the time. It's like, oh, we could get spun bowls and things like this and make some equipment. Like we had access to nothing in New Zealand. Okay except what we could make ourselves. So, and I saw this and I thought, I, I wouldn't mind making this stuff because I liked, and I found that I enjoyed the handcraft side of things. So I got into making armor and then swords and it And had you ever been any there. kind of like model maker or anything like that no, in your, no, no just, just no, kind of. I, I did shop, I did machine shop and woodworking at school, but that was really sure. it. Uh, did plastic kits, mostly aeroplanes, but uh, yeah, no, nothing like that. But again, I'm, I'm not sure if I had any particular ability or whether it was just that obsessive focus that I just, I just got into things and just kept going. And w w so what was the first thing that you made? Um, oh, the first sword I made, well, the first sword I started, not necessarily the first sword I finished was, um, and I was inspired by the Conan movie in a way. Oh, ah. and so so the Conan movie was telling me swords should be short and heavy. <laughs> so I made a I made a two handed sword that was reasonably short. I made the blade out of half inch thick spring steel. You can imagine how heavy that was, and made it a certain way that was quite complicated and not necessarily ideal. And I finished that slowly over a couple of years, including hand filing the blade after I'd rough ground it. So lots and lots of hours of hand filing. And eventually got that finished and it was um quite a nicely finished sword but it was a terrible sword it was <laughs> short it was heavy it was clumsy uh yeah the real ones are cra crazy i mean they're 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 very short uh and they're like nine pounds or eight pounds each yeah. i mean they're just they're un un unwieldable and then but then when you yeah. see arnold unless you're unless you're arnold <laughs> swinging around the movie you realize just because he's holding the hero for most of the film you realize just yeah. how crazy strong that guy was to make it look you like you almost a piece of wanted a scene that i guess isn't in the movie where like someone like someone you know, else tries to... <laughs> tr tries to pick up his sword like gets mm. the jump on him and almost yeah. like because I'm not sure that yeah. never really comes through when you're watching the no. movie. It just seems like a sword. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's yeah. no sense of like no other person could yeah. lift this, which mm. I don't know, yeah. wherever that fits yeah. in. Yeah. The, the, the other movie that does do that in a very over the top way is uh, Lady Hawk. Right. You know oh, that God, movie? Yes. 
Yeah, yep. uh, you know that that moment where Matthew Broderick's character tries to pick up, pick, yeah. picks up the sword, and it's like, oh, it weighs a ton. And I'm like, guy, come on, you must be you must be built like a pipe cleaner if you can't pick that up, because <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a real useful looking sword. But but yeah, they they overplayed that point, but made the point. <laughs> Do you still have your 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 homemade Conan sword? Um, no, I unsold that a few years ago just to make a bit of money, and. Uh. Um, uh, it was just that I had no no real attachment to it. It was sure it was where I started, but it was not a reflection of what I saw myself as. So where are you going? I was yeah. fine about selling it. Are there movies like that you love the swords from that obviously you did not work on, and are there movies that drive you a little crazy uh, when you see swords on movie or TV or whatever? Yeah, I, I'm I like I'm not trying to be the swordsmith that makes swords for every movie ever. Like there's not enough of me to go around. So hmm. I appreciate the work that goes into swords on movies like Princess Bride. Love the swords. You know, they're beautiful swords. They're actually practical. Uh, a lot of other oh, 80s and 90s fantasy movies. The the swords in those are often pretty terrible <laughs> um, as swords. But sure. what I also find interesting is that quite often when I get to see some original props, admittedly they've been set used and had a bit of wear and tear, but I'm actually often looking at some of these original swords that look really good on screen. And I'm like, how did you get away with that? Because some of the stuff is... Oh, so when you're seeing them in not, person, they not, just really yeah, don't look great. It, you oh, realize that, that you, can, you can make a prop and then you can present it to camera on the day looking a certain way and yeah, you know, admittedly back in the days of 720 resolution before we got to 4k and 8k coming like you could get away with a lot <laughs> like the the mantra that somebody told me was um put put your hand up in front of your face and then do this and that's how it's going to look on screen <laughs> like this tells you what you can get away with like on lord of the rings there were um there were bits of cord and gaffer tape and zip ties everywhere, but you really don't see them. And then people like us love finding those things now in retrospect as you study the films and oh, as yeah. they get upscaled to 4K. I mean, because we're, you know, we're looking very closely at these frames to try to authenticate mm. something or figure out how it was made or how yeah. the one in the film actually looked to try to line these things up. And sometimes you do find the occasional zip tie and, uh, and we all enjoy that because it, sh it shows yeah. the... Uh, oh. The, well, the, the... if you've got the time, they're all over the place in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> That's great. That's great to hear. Um, Lord of the zip ties. So, um... so, so you're 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 moving along your life. You're making swords. Yeah. At, at, at at some point, you become a proper swordsmith, where you're before mm. the movies come calling, right? Where you're where you're 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 an artist yeah. making swords for hire, and uh, uh, presumably making a living doing it. Or was this a side gig, or what? Well, what was it? Yeah. Um, uh, this gets back to the uh, that lovely struggling artist paradigm mm -hmm. or starving artist. I did get to a point where I was doing pretty well. Say, so I started making swords in '82. My I, well, my very first sword in '82, and by the mid '90s, I was thinking, yeah, I think I can make a living out of this, and I was doing reasonable, reasonably good swords for reenactment, durable swords because that's what they needed, mm -hmm. tough rather than uh, perfect. But I also always also had this thing that with my obsessiveness, I was like, I didn't want to make the most swords. I wanted to make the best swords. And that was what actually drove me to be useful when Lord of the Rings came knocking. When I was offered to work on Lord of the Rings, I was actually at a point where I had enough skills that I could learn the stuff I needed for the rest of it, like etching. And, and then I learned a bit about how film works. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. I was so that was to... that was full on your first film job. You were was, just yeah. doing oh, swords yeah, yeah. for um, reenactors and collectors at that <laughs> yep, point. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to start, why not start at the top? Yeah. That's quite a first <laughs> job. Yeah, and quite yeah, um, and quite and a I, responsibility I, to be given. I didn't actually appreciate what I walked into until years later. So, like, I'd had an interest in the technical side of filmmaking. I was never wanting to be in front of camera. Um, way too self-conscious but i was interested in the technical technical side of filmmaking so when lord of the rings came along and and they were keeping it ultra secret of course at the time so i didn't even know it was lord of the rings till i was actually on board did you like at some point did you start to realize like huh i just sold 10 swords to some guy named jackson in like like were they like like ordering your swords like oh. checking you out like do you have any sense no. of that in, in hindsight oh, um, 
I'll get there's an interesting little story with that, but I'll come back to that. So anyway, I got the work on Lord of the Rings, and I was in house at Weta Workshop. So, but prior to that, no, I hadn't sold swords to Peter Jackson, though I had sold a couple to Richard Taylor, you know, who runs Weta. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so, swords that he was buying for himself, or he was sort of scouting because he kind of knew. I suspect that it was a mixture. Okay. Yeah, bit of a bit of both. And there's a really interesting story about how I met Richard. And this is a perfect example of how the film industry and luck works. Like, um, I met him in 98, and a friend of mine who was a stunty, who had worked on Meet the Feebles, not sure, Meet the Feebles, but one of his splatter movies he said oh this guy Richard Taylor you should probably go and talk to him it could be worth knowing him in future so I contacted Richard at the time he was working on the Hercules TV series and you know we got on well and he just said at the time look we don't have a need for your skills at the moment but if the right job ever comes along I'll keep you in mind so I kept sending out you know again printed paper catalogs that my wife Helen helped me with and I got a response from Richard saying he'd like to meet me. And so as a result of this string of fortuitous circumstances, I met Richard and he obviously decided that I had enough skills to be useful to them and that I could probably pick up the rest that I needed. And that's how I got on to Lord of the Rings. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, first film job. And I didn't appreciate how big a deal it was until years later. Yeah, it was actually towards the end and I was starting to see stuff for fan responses and the the, the excitement that people were getting from clips like the um uh you know the uh troll fight and stuff like that that got released at Cannes and, and the buzz going with that and I started and suddenly I realized actually this is a really big deal to a lot of people. <laughs> Whereas to me it was a job that had to be done. And probably that's good because otherwise I would have been freaked out. You might, you might, it might have freaked you out. Yeah, I mean, it's, and in that, in that way, it was good. I mean, I, so I mean, it was like I said, it was a huge deal to me. I actually saw that troll sequence when um, uh, Barry Osborne come to New York mm. and to Lincoln Center. Uh, I think it probably September. This is September of two thousand one. Yeah. Uh, uh, pre, you know, just probably a week before uh, September eleventh. And a few, three months then before the release of the first film and showed it at this like film gala mm. at Lincoln Center. And I just remember, I, again, I had been following it on the one ring, not net as a, you know, ex very excited little mm -hmm. Tolkien nerd for years and to be able to see it come to life that way. And I, seeing that scene, I knew that he had totally nailed it. It just, it was just like through and through it was it was Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and it was like leaping off the screen yeah. and the page had come alive and it was so exciting and then I just hated having to wait three more months to you know to see to see the first film but um but and seeing the stuff I mean the way the way the the way the the weapons the armor looked the way Legolas's bow looked yeah. certainly the swords yeah. um uh you know the orcs and their weaponry it was just it, all of that that stuff mm -hmm. and the, the I layers remember watching of that it made and it thinking real. there needed to be more jewels oh. on the swords <laughs> yeah. but I'm sorry yeah. on the hilt yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that would have made my life more difficult <laughs> so so but, yeah. that's, my think, com that's my only that's my only complaint I, otherwise it's yeah. a perfect movie yeah I think the thing that people really loved and this came this came about because Peter Jackson's basic opening lines and throughout the whole production was it's a fantasy world, but we need we want this to feel like a real world that's lived in. And so you didn't get mm. this thing of, oh, somebody's just worked, walked fresh out of the costume department in this beautiful new outfit. Like stuff was lived in. People were lived in. The yeah. world had been lived in. And you felt that even if you didn't see much of it, that there was a whole history behind everything. And it actually gave it a grounding that so many fantasy films have all have often lacked. Yeah, 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 and I, I agree. And I think I think it, that that sort of aesthetic was uh, was copied or honored or aped or however you want to uh, you know uh, uh, oh, you know in the in the years to come. And it was just it was such a it was such a seminal thing because fa most fantasy had looked kind of dodgy. You know, up up, yep. until, up until that point, there were a few films that were, you know, the original Conan obviously being one of them. Sometimes dodgy, almost in the opposite way of 
too shiny where like mm, yeah. every all the armor looks like yeah. somebody just, just made it. it and had like an electric buffer yeah. of some sort you know like that <laughs> yeah. that very yeah. sort of mm -hmm. overly ridiculous kind yeah. of yeah shiny yeah. is the yeah. perfect yeah. Word. no feeling yeah. that these people have actually lived a life that their equipment has has lived a life and you know some will be new some will be old and broken down and most in between it's right. yeah so so can you take just take us through the basic process of making a sword for the original Lord of the Rings, like how, how what, sure. you know, from co basically from concept to completion, I know, you know, John Howe and Alan Lee are involved. They're doing drawings like, wh you know, where do you get involved and what did, what did that look like for you to deliver a finished okay. sort of quote unquote sure. hero sword to the production? My involvement would usually start when I was given a finished art piece. Sometimes I was involved in the, in the, design a little bit but generally that wasn't my thing so John Howe in particular was really valuable because at the time he was a member of the company of St George which was one of the premier recreation groups in in Europe and oh, so he cool. had this knowledge of how armor works like because he would wear armor he knew how a sword worked because he practiced with swords so he had an understanding of how if you add too much stuff to a sword it just becomes heavy and clunky and hard to use and it doesn't look like it's a believable weapon so he was very influential and he helped train other designers with that aesthetic as well so he was really had draw, he was amount. draw he was drawing from experience yeah. oh, as yeah. opposed yeah. to just yeah. I like and, and actually a, yeah. this is why some of the some of the swords in lord of the rings look quite grounded because a lot of them are variations on medieval themes andril is a good example because it's a medieval cruciform two-handed sword, a smallish two-handed sword, but it's a it's a classic medieval European sword with some design tweaks that keep it believable but makes it unique. And that's that's a really hard balance to to get because like it's really really easy to over design stuff, and like you see it so often like oh we need something on this I oh, will add spikes or cross skulls or something to it. Um, whereas sometimes the subtlety of the design is what actually tells you it's a, a believable weapon. Like Sting is one of my favorites for that. A few little design things like the way that cross is made, the way that the etching curls along the cross and down the blade, it's all, it's all quite subtle, well thought out design. And that needs design iterations and time, which is something we did have on Lord of the Rings. But for the most part, I'd be given these designs ready to build. I did have some small pointers along the way, like um, they, were, they were struggling with Anderil, trying to figure out how to get everything they wanted on the blade. And they were trying things like two lines of lettering and, and it was very small and I knew the camera would never see it. So I just said, well, how about doing your classic European thing of one long single fuller and you string everything along that fuller. And when they tried that, it worked out quite well. But for the most part, I didn't have that much influence because I, I was also learning design as I went. I uh, picked up a lot of stuff about how you design good stuff from people that were, you know, you'd do 10 drawings and two of them might be considered good, but the others were still learning. And when I get a design, I look at it as a two-dimensional design, which is mostly what we get given on paper. And then I look at it, how does this work in three dimensions? How does how do the elements of this pop out from the two-dimensional page? How is it going to look at different angles? Um, and just try to make that work. Beef things up or thin things down to make the weight and balance right. Because um, again, with the experience I've got now, I can generally look at a design and say, it's going to weigh this much, it's going to balance here, or this is going to be too, too heavy in the hand or blade heavy or whatever. Um, and, you know, I just know the proportions that work. And from there, I'd break down the build process. And generally, the blades are uh, ground out of uh, spring steel bar. Forging usually doesn't give any advantages unless it's a blade that's got a lot of curvature and you can't get that out of a single strip of steel. So mostly ground. The crosses and pommels were, if they're bronze, they were cast. If they were steel, they were actually cut out of blocks of steel. Again, I, I actually avoided forging stuff where I could because the advantage of starting with a block of steel is that you've got a nice squared off piece of material. So you can mark profiles, then you cut it out, then you mark your 
plan form and then you just start reducing from there. Essentially the way I describe it to people is I see the shape inside the block, I just remove everything that I don't want. Simple okay. in principle, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's very, uh, very Michelangelo kind of uh, yeah. like, yeah, you just sort of have yeah, to like, I, like, I think, it, I think yeah, uh, looking at the block of marble and what, what do I, what do I get rid of? Yes. Uh, but I, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. And, and a bit like marble, if you go, oops, it's like you can't add it back. Uh, yeah. It's either you work with what you've got and tweak things or you start again. And were you, were you all, were you primarily making blades at this point? Uh, or were you were you kind of responsible for everything, including the furniture, do, you know, do, doing any kind of leather work that was involved in the in with the grips? Well, we had specialist leather workers and other okay. people were helping with scabbards and other stuff. Sculptors would be uh, making things that would would be you know, doing clay or plasticine sculpts of things that would be cast into bronze. So that was split out, and I was okay. working mainly on the swords. Initially, I did a bit of armoring work, but we also had two specialist armorers working on the crew. So at one point I said to Richard, well, I'd be quite happy just to make the swords and let the other guys work on all the armor. And that turned out to actually be, uh, as one of those little chance conversations that defined the rest of my career. Because yeah. I dropped the armor side completely and became a sword maker. You really became a sword guy. On that yeah. day. I was just curious with like when you were looking around the shop of the people that they had sort of gathered, were they other familiar faces from oh, the yeah. reenactment yeah. world? Oh, they, like, were, were you they, like, they were both like, reenactors. Gotcha. I yeah. just figured I was sort of yeah. thinking that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it, it, cool. was a, it was a very small, almost ingrown world in New Zealand, I, I guess you could say. Yeah. Like uh, everyone, everyone knew everyone, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure, because it was, it was, it was such an, it's such an island, and they they were desperate yeah. to find oh, yeah. oh, talent you know, and the knowledge. Six degrees on... of, yeah, the six degrees of separation thing. The joke was that if you're in Wellington, you're you're lucky if you reach two degrees of separation, <laughs> and and people would say, hey, I know somebody that works on Lord of the Rings, and everyone else would go, meh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're so, in Wellington, so we you're involved. <laughs> yeah. Or you know somebody that's involved. Yeah. Um, how, how involved was, uh, how, or not, how hands-on was Peter Jackson in the actual sword, not the making process, of course, but the, mm. the design process, was he coming in at multiple phases and checking things oh, out? Yeah. Was he checking out the, the, yep. the design and then yep. seeing the final where you know, did you yep. see him in the shop totally. all the time? Yeah. Yeah. So he'd start with a, an array of potential designs for a sword like sting. And then he would narrow it down, and then that. Peter, would I, sorry, design. I do want to. Inter I want to interrupt really quickly. I yeah. think Ryan is looking for a certain amount of oh. you telling him that <laughs> him constantly being in the shops at House of the Dragon <laughs> is not is not weird or bad. He oh. wants to hear. He wants to hear that oh, yeah. somebody else was constantly oh, yeah. touching the swords yeah. and swinging them oh. around and putting on the legend. Stuff. Peter, yeah. Peter, yes. Peter yeah. Jackson wasn't really that sort of guy. He he was like when you've finished the cutouts at scale and everything's tied down, then yeah, it gets. He would look at things during the build, um, but he wasn't fanboying, shall we say? But like, <laughs> let me just let me say right now, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with you wanting to be in the sword making shop every day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Thank to me, you. that sounds that. Utter, that sounds acceptable. Yeah. Thank you. See, Dave. Um, uh, but w was he, cause I, I, you know, I know from his, his background, you know, he, I mean, he certainly was very interested in like the creature stuff and things like that. But I was just, mm. I was always curious as like, how, yep. how do you, how do you direct those three films and be mm. that involved in sort of everything that goes into the process? So I was just curious with something as kind of specific and niche as swords, which I'm a, obviously interested it's in. It's a how, really how interesting question. Like I look back at it now and I don't know how it worked. And I think basically what it came down to is that we didn't know that it was impossible. So we did it. Yeah. That's what it came down to. Like the fact that, you know, you know how complex the organization is on a, a film or TV project, how easy it is for things to spin out of control if you're not really focused and everyone's on the same page. Yeah, it would have been so easy for everything to go wrong. Like, you know, Peter Jackson was famous for handing new pages of script to actors on set on the day. And like normally, normally anyone outside looking at that says, I see a disaster in the making. But actually his, each time he did that, it was improving things, getting it, you know, he'd be picking bit, bits out of Tolkien's text and bringing it into the film. 
even at short notice. Yeah. And, do, and there were so that... many things on Lord of the Rings that sounded like it was a recipe for disaster, but it worked somehow. Did that same sort of pulling things out ever come into your world? And I guess what oh, I mean yeah. is like, I don't like we like all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, I'm adding this character or this mm. character needs a oh, sword. Yeah. Like we didn't think they needed a sword, but now they need a sword kind of a thing. Yeah. You may be aware. You're probably aware of the infamous uh, Strider versus Sauron scene that never apparently got filmed or if it got filmed, it quietly got buried. Yeah. But like, but like. You know, at one point, Strider was meant to actually, Aragorn was meant to actually have the your standard boss fight with Sauron. And we all know how ridiculous that sounds when Sauron's nine foot tall demigod, basically. Um, no, it doesn't matter. No, no one, however good they are, can't stand up to him. But at one point, we were given a design that was like, OK, we want to have this up at Mount Ruapehu, I think it was, in five days, I think it was for a, a hero sword for Sauron. Oh, so he was, it was, he was going to somehow be personified and have a yep, yep. giant sword yep. or something? Because it's, yeah. it's the classic movie trope of that you have to have your big good guy and your big bad guy have their showdown. But they decided, they realized in the end that how ridiculous it was going to look and um, went for the more restrained thing that was closer to Tolkien. But that was a thing I turned around in five days. And, and at one point, uh, there was, towards the end of filming, when everyone understood the design, eth design ethos for all the different races and everything else, one day Richard Taylor hands me an A4 sheet with a, a sword sketch on it for, I think it was, I think it might have been Baragond, uh, a, a secondary character who was suddenly going to pop up and maybe get filmed close up because with Peter Jackson there was no such thing as a deep background prop every prop like mm. one day he, he could on any given day say oh that all way off in the background I want you in front of camera so it, nothing was deep background we couldn't get away with that and so in this case this was a sword that might be seen and I was um, given an A4 sketch and and literally told you know what you're doing make it <laughs> oh and it, I think it was three wow. days <laughs> Did it make? Or it might have been uh, a bit over a week, but but it, it make, was like did to it me that was a huge. Did it make the movie? Did it end up getting seen? I, or? It may be seen. It, it, Baragon is one of the guards of the White Tree at Gondor, so right. you probably see him in the background. But yeah, quick turn around, and uh, I took that as a huge compliment, of course, to just be trusted to make something that to looked pull that apart. off. Because yeah, right. we knew what. Because after what was it, three years making stuff, we pretty much knew you what... You got good at it. You got good at it, yeah. Yeah, but also we, we'd nailed down the look of things. Um, these days, I'm not so sure that that could happen because, yeah, there are so many people that need to be involved. Yeah, there will never be another project like Lord of the Rings, um, partly because we operate in a different world now. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's you know, sort of, you know, if Star Wars was kind of the first, mm. you know, seminal big budget, you know, kind of yep. world changing genre film that was made independently, Lord of the Rings was the last, you know, is that, yep. that sort of era was yep. bookended by those two movies and just the way yep. that, that and, and certainly Lord the original, the Rings, not less the Hobbit. Lord of the, the Rings way. straddled a really interesting point in filmmaking history too. These days, everything can be done digitally. Hmm. And, you know, the, the infamous line of, oh, we'll fix it post <laughs> is... Right. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, whatever you catch on the day, you can do anything you like with it digitally now. But back in back in the late nineties, early two thousands, of course, we were in this transition between purely in camera and the digital era that was coming, with CGI coming in and digital compositing becoming quite useful. Lord of the Rings hit a sweet spot there. So like we wanted the the physical props, but the technology was enough to support things like digital compositing of scenery and some CGI, you know, obviously the troll being a great example and um, Gollum being a, a triumph. Yeah. Like Gollum still looks good today yeah, he does. against yeah, yeah. the best of modern CGI. And again, how the hell did we do that? I don't know, but we did. Um, but yeah, those days are gone. Uh, everything, it's a whole different world now of filmmaking. And also an 18 month, uh, 18 month pre-production period not a chance. Nope. Like these yeah. days we get four if we're lucky. Yeah. And sometimes uh, by the time a director 
no offense, of course, by the time a director has actually decided what the hell they want, it's like, you want it when? And we've burned up how much time? Yeah. Yeah. You're not, uh, you're not wrong. Um, 18 months. I mean, that's, that's crazy. and so luxurious, yeah, but it's the reason, incredible, the, yeah. the reason the, the movies are as good as they are. Um, uh, do, what, do you have so what, a, Oh, I was just gonna ask, do you have a, when you look back on all the Lord of the Rings swords, do you have a personal favorite? Oh, I do. Andril. I, Andril, I, I love okay. two-handed swords. You mentioned it anyway. a couple of times. I was curious yeah. if that was and, the one. And, yeah. yeah. Andril is my second favorite film sword. Um, oh. Which my leads favorite to the question, is actually, what's your favorite? Yeah. My, okay. Because the sword in particular, the two-handed sword of Aureus from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you don't see it very much, but yeah. as a piece of sword making, it was very cool and a lot of work. But in Lord of the Rings, Andril by far the winner. Like It's a very featured sword, obviously, but also it's just the sort of sword I like personally. Oh, wow. Great very answer. Cool. So what can I ask, uh, what was the first principal hero sword that you delivered to the production i actually can't remember <laughs> it's like those early days are such a blur i think i was working on about five swords at once probably things like sting strider's sword and several of the other lead actor swords probably partly to um, have them ready for actors to hold in hand yeah. so it, it probably would have it might have actually been something like strider's sword okay which is a reasonably straightforward weapon to make. Yeah, that's my favorite, just because I I always love mm. that character and I love well, yeah. I love Strider as as Strider as yeah. the ranger mm. before he becomes yeah. you know Aragorn the you know the and, wayward king. Yeah, and it's a great example of it's a sword that would work for that character in in a real world because that's a hand and a half sword, so your classic mm. European long sword, and it's actually closely modelled off swords from around 1480. So things like the by knife and thing was something that was done in Europe at the time. And that's mm. John Howe's influence again. But it's a very practical sword. It's uh, long enough to give you reach, but it's short enough that you can do half sorting techniques with it and yeah, use it up close. It's the sort of sword that somebody like Aragorn would wear, not something like uh, Andril would probably be too awkward for a guy who's knocking around in the wilds all the time. It's just too clumsy. You've yeah. got to remember too, 99% of the time that sword lives in its scabbard. So most of the time you're, you're tripping over this thing and getting pissed off with it, except for those moments when you really, really need it. When you were, uh, I was just curious, when you were making like, uh, like Sting, for example, did you, and, but also maybe any weapons in general for the Hobbits, did you have to make various sizes oh, for yeah. like, 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 was there a kid oh, yeah. size version, so to speak? So like yep, when. Totally. Well, you've got to remember, of course, that. For close-ups, all your lead actors, whether they're a hobbit, a dwarf, human, elf, whatever, they're all played by people. Right. So, so with uh, Lord of the Rings, you, they had small actors to do the shots. Say, seen from behind, you would see the hobbits with right, humans. Right. Like a wider shot or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so then, so then a whole set of scaled-down equipment was made for them. In the Hobbit, of course, we then have uh, most of the actors you see are playing dwarves. Then you have a hobbit, then you have humans and elves. And so then you've got three different scales that some things had to be made in. That's and then wild. you'd have you'd have one or two hero steel, probably about four or five aluminium bladed stunt versions that could still flash, you know, flash light to the camera. Then there were soft versions, cut down versions for digital blade extension. Yeah. So actually a sword like Sting in the end, there were probably about 20 oh, and scales two or three different scales so there might have been 20 different versions of sting on set to wow. get sting in shot it's um, wow. yeah you know, the logistics got a bit crazy but in terms in terms of the heroes that were coming out of your shop i mean you said one or two but is that one or two then of each scale yeah yeah oh wow so sting in two scales i think most of your your lead actors had two hero steals and that was just to cover the fact that you might be shooting on two sets simultaneously that could be in different parts of the country so you okay. might have the actor with the sword on one set and you may have the sword as a background prop on another set where they're doing um yeah you know, where they've got a, another director doing background shots and things with the doubles or because whatever. of yeah. course towards the end like wow. a lot of films do you get as the time crunch happens you get so many little split out right little uh, multiple split units out groups yeah. that, are, that are given like okay we need this shot bam you do it splinters you figure it. yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, I've heard of some films ending up with like seven splinter units <laughs> when things got desperate towards the end. Hey, the Stuff Dreams Are Made Of podcast listeners. Uh, Heritage Auctions, our new sponsor, is putting out the Greg Jean catalog for $50. However, we've got a special offer just for you listeners. This catalog, which is normally $50, for you at the link in our show information, there's a link there right now, you can get the catalog for $25, only for Stuff Dreams Are Made Of listeners. It is such a great catalog, I told them to print extra. I told them our listeners are gonna buy this catalog. That's how good it is. And I guess I need to tell you that if they don't sell, I'm gonna get stuck buying them all. So please, click on the link and buy a catalog. $25, 50% off, set phaser for half off. Okay, so question for you. Andrew is your favorite. Was that, uh, was that your favorite to make? Was there one that was a particular challenge to make because you had never done anything like that before or trying to get, you know, trying to get the, you know, the blade to join to the hilt or what, you know, some aspect it, of it, the design yeah. that was just a big yeah, pain the in challenge, the ass right. or something. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to remember there's nothing that was a particular pain in the ass. Some were more work than others, but once I could see the breakdown in my head and how this, and like, I'm good at three dimensional thinking. So I could actually mm. break, I can break down mechanical stuff and reassemble them in my head and see where the conflict points are and stuff like that and avoid them. So I never really ran into those sorts of problems. It's just some of them were a bit more work than others. So yeah, there, there was nothing there that was like, oh, this could be a, a game breaker for me. The, the ultimate question that we always have to ask for anybody that worked on the film, did you keep anything? Do you have anything from Lord of the Rings? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I'm wow. like the mechanic that never works on their own car. I've got <laughs> one sword from my reenacting days, and that's it. Oh, really? At any point, did they say to you, do you want to just grab one? And you just went, nah, it's okay? Or no, I've no, never, never asked that. <laughs> I've never asked that. I've, I've never been asked that on any project. I feel that's very um, sad. I feel like, do you have any of the replicas or any of the ones that you've no, been involved no. with? No. Oh, my gosh. No. Well, when you've made the original why the, yeah replicas? why the replicas no i get yeah. that i get that oh here's a question for you peter i was gonna i was gonna save it for uh uh the very end before we let you go but is there going to be uh if you can talk about it is there going to be a further addition to the master Smith, master smith's sword line that weta makes where you actually go back and recreate the uh the hero swords from a lord of the rings and the hobbit uh to release to the public in very small numbers yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, we're working on, well, we're just winding down the Orcrist edition, which is the only right. Hobbit sword in the, right. in the release. So got the last three underway on that at the moment, and we're working on the next one, which I'm not sure I can actually announce because I don't think it's been done officially yet, so I don't want to preempt it. But, yeah, there are, there are ongoing things, and the beauty of that for me as a maker is... Um, Partly it fills in the gaps between other work, but also it lets me go back to stuff that I was making over 20 years ago and, and make it now with 20 more years of experience. Yeah. Of course, cool. it also means that I've got to make it much better. <laughs> but yeah, these, these are going to be ongoing until I retire, probably. Oh, like, great. I'm, I'm turning 60 in February. So like I've been around for a bit now and uh, I draw a pension at 65. <laughs> And after that, we'll see. Like, uh, I mean, on my personally too is like these are they're great bread and butter, and it's great revisiting some of these designs. But at the same time, I'm also um, I've, I've taken a long hiatus from personal work for various reasons, and uh, I'm just sort of starting to get back into a, a little bit of that, looking at doing things that I find artistically interesting mainly. Like there's no yeah. point in me making the same s historical sword that six other companies make. My thing is what I call practical fantasy. And that's why I loved Lord of the Rings because they were fantasy swords, but there was nothing silly about them. Sure. And uh, I mean, you, you've got that too with House of Dragons. I've got, got to do some name dropping here, of course. Uh, of course, you've got Peter Johnson making your two hero, hero swords. Yeah. And, like, and, and I'm a huge fan of Peter Johnson. I've, I've only met him a couple of times, but like his depth of knowledge of the theory as well as the making is quite amazing. And like what he did for House of the Dragon was to me a perfect blend of the fantasy elements with a sword that's still very practical. 
Yeah, you know, and yeah. both of those lead swords and um, beautiful design, beautiful execution. And it, you always look at them and you think this is a real sword. It's not just a chunk of metal. Yeah, yeah, and they and they they're alive in the hand in that way. And mm. and yeah. um, you know, I I I credit I credit you. I credit uh, Richard Taylor, Peter Jackson. You know, the the creative team behind Lord of the Rings because the reason that I I I chased down uh, Peter specifically when we were starting to make. Um, we're getting into pre pre production in the original shows because I knew how long the lead time was to make a real proper yep. sword, mm. and we didn't actually yep. we didn't have and, an and armor. And of course, Peter's yet. got limited limited work that he can take on too. He can't yeah. just well, he's one, drop he's everything one guy. for six months. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I had to. Yeah. So it was there was a lot of a lot of dominoes had to kind of fall in the right direction, but mm. we didn't we didn't even have our armor yet. You know, Tim Tim Lewis was our yep. master armor. Mm. Um, we hadn't we hadn't hired that department yet, so we had a yep. production designer, and then I I really wanted to hire. I always admired Peter's work, um, his his original work uh, from afar, and I knew he had all the skill sets to be a one stop shop to make these two things. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to assign off these two swords, and that was it. I mean, I, the, we were going to have an armor that was going to come in and do yep. everything else, and uh, and I I was inspired by the fact that Lord of the Rings had had hired and used you a yeah. proper real swordsmith. It wasn't a mm. prop maker. It was also what they did on Conan. You know, they used Jody Sampson yep. to come yep. in and there was a whole bunch of other things went into the making of those swords, but they had a proper sword maker who knew blades yep. and knew how to make mm. a real weapon and made it for, made it for film. And I wanted yep. to do the same thing for, for our show, for its legacy. And mm. uh, yeah, Peter, Peter knocked it out of the park. He did a, yeah. he did a really good so job. I'm curious about that too. Did he, do a lot of the design work himself or did you have a finished design ready no that was all peter and that was the other thing that okay. i knew is he i knew he had a design capacity from all yep. of the you know I, yep. I, he had built well, a sword for me years ago just a, yep. a, a custom medieval you know one-off that he did and he had designed he had designed it himself and i knew he mm -hmm. he you know he would borrow things from uh, his deep knowledge of museums and traveling to places and then he had this capacity to make fantasy pieces too that were grounded in reality mm. so i turned it completely over to him i mean we consulted with our production designer jim clay a bit and he would he would give feedback and i would give feedback as we went along but those were purely peter's designs that he was iterating as we went yeah. along so mm -hmm. he uh, you know he is responsible for those uh from kind of concept to completion yeah. and uh and he's you know Hopefully he's getting the recognition that he deserves for yeah. it because he yeah. did a I, great I remember, job. I remember at the time on Facebook, he was a bit cagey about, I'm working on something really cool, but I can't say anything <laughs> about it. <laughs> yeah. He told me, he told me when he went to the, uh, cause he, you know, he had, he had the blades made at this, um, uh, forge in Sweden that makes, uh, kitchen steel you know so they, they oh, do they work steels? In, uh, they work in stainless actually oh yeah uh, but oh. but at you know at knife size and because it's yep. repeatable and it's super mm -hmm. hard and tough yeah and um he thought that because it was you know factory the way the the way the foundry works mm -hmm. and i don't forgive me i don't know enough about the metallurgy of it he knew that even though they wouldn't be uh, effective as pure weapons they would really work as weapon balanced weapons as movie props so they wouldn't be yeah. sh sharp obviously the blades mm -hmm. aren't sharp yeah. um but he also knew that you could touch the blade and not have to worry about immediately wiping yeah. it off or you know oxidizing or whatever oh, yeah. and uh when when he went to them and oh, he said they're I'm... stainless steels aren't they so they are, you don't yeah. have to worry about the the rust the way that i always did on lord of the rings yeah so, so luckily there's... of course we wanted aged looks so rust was actually a bonus rust, was, sometimes. <laughs> rust i guess was okay but yeah no they're 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 great and you don't have to take care of them in the way yeah. that you would actually mm -hmm. you know owning a real sword and i think at some point he had to tell them that he was he was working in the film business and he a had to ask them can you make damascus steel at sword length and their eyes got really big because they i think they all kind of figured out you know, they knew the prequel was getting yeah. made and they all uh, kind of figured out what they were doing. So they yeah. had to keep very quiet about it as they made this thing in this like, yeah. you know, distant foundry somewhere in the, uh, in the but wild. Probably they had been waiting their entire life for yeah, somebody for to that say, call. can you yeah. make something so ask that like, question. even if it had been the worst movie in the world, mm. can you make something yeah. sword yeah. length was probably, yeah. you know, they thought about it yeah. a lot. Yeah. So P Peter, what is your, what is your day to day like today? I mean, I, you're, you're, you're obviously, you're, yep. you're still with Weta. You're, you're working yep. on, um, when you have the time, some of these, um, mm -hmm. I, I would call them consumer products, but that's probably a, a, well, uh, I mean, dumbing down of what the, the master Smith's line is, but yeah, I mean, consumer products is literally the name of the department that I'm doing these for. So, so yeah, they are, 
they're yeah. consumer products, but they're still art, art pieces. pieces. They're they're also um, the craft. And this is the weird thing: directors will look really closely at props, but collectors I take it to another level. So like the the level of finish that we have to achieve to keep the collectors happy is quite amazing. <laughs> you don't so, say. So like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's not often that I can say that directors aren't as demanding, but yeah, this is one of those occasions. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, this, the, I'm very excited to hear that the line is going to continue because mm. I'm, uh, I'm yeah. one of my great regrets as a collector is having seen all of those beautiful editions that you've yeah. done go by without having jumped on one. So I'm making the commitment right now. Yeah. I am, I am going to pick up one from uh, whatever the next edition that you do is because I need to have Excellent. a Peter Lyon made hero blade in yeah. my, oh, in my great. collection. Yeah. So I suspect I'm, you know, they're basically going to go on as long as I can. Uh, like, you know, I don't know how many working years I've got left in me. Uh, I'm currently working four day weeks because it lets me get through a week without being broken. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's just that thing of it's, it's a physically hard job at times and sure uh, I'm getting older. I'm in good shape for my age, but um, I'm still getting older. So yeah, I think they'll continue as long as I'm able to keep doing them. And uh, hopefully that's a few more years yet. Great. Well, I'm in as soon as you're ready to go on <laughs> the next one. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and beyond that, I mean, are you, is, is the, is the film industry in, in New Zealand and, and wet is busy all the time. I mean, I know they're doing digital work all the time. Yep. Are you still busy in that, in that world? I know you can't talk about anything that, that you're um, working on, but sort are... of yes. And well, not so much these days because, um, the days where, um, you know, a production would want a, a lot of hero steel swords to put in front of camera. They're pretty much gone. We're doing a lot now as hero aluminium swords, often with urethane hilts, because okay. a lot of our hilts are now completely 3D modeled. So in a way, it's a lot of that work is bypassing my department. But then very occasionally, we are still getting a movie like Mulan, where they wanted the hero sword that had to do some very specific things like be a mirror. And hmm. yeah, they wanted a handmade hero steel prop. But not so much these days. So it makes the it makes me happy that we've got the Master Swordsmith collection to, to actually keep us going because you can't just sort of put somebody on a shelf for a couple of years and then expect them to, to be available when you need them for the next job and stuff. So keeping that continuity of work is actually quite a quite a big deal. Yeah. And we can still do our, our own personal work, especially if we're wanting to learn new things. So um my protege Chris Mengers is is um has been picking up stuff with me for the last three or four years now. He's going to be my replacement. I joke to people visiting the workshop, "Oh, meet my replacement, Chris," <laughs> which sort of puts puts some people on the back heel of it. It's like what? Yeah. But yeah, it's a good joke. Like he's yeah, going to well... take my job, but hopefully not before I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But well... but then Chris is also um he's. I'm trapped in a way because I'm so good at what I do that for me to go into other areas is awkward. Like I'm needed on particular jobs so much. Whereas Chris is doing stuff that I have never done. Like he's playing with pattern welding and a lot of other things that I really don't have time to because I don't have enough time left to learn whole new branches. So I've got to do what I'm good at. Chris is um, going into areas that I'm finding very interesting and doing things that I probably won't be able to do myself. So that's quite cool. And like he's bringing a, a new a new angle to the whole job in a way. And hopefully, uh, you know, keeping sword making as a live department for once I'm finished up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, yeah. I think so, let, I, let us let us hope sword uh, making yeah. stays as yeah. a live I mean, department. I hope, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I hope that there's a, a place for handmade hero swords in the future. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Like, well, as long as Ryan like, Condal has $200 <laughs> in his pocket, you will always, <laughs> there will always be a place for sword there making. There will always be a place. Uh, yeah, no, we're, we're we, you know, we, we, we will, more to come, but we, you know, we've really, we've really strove uh, as the show goes on to keep that, yeah. keep that alive on our show. Cause yeah. it was, I think I it was so uh, well received and also kind of, um, yeah, I think oh. unique to to our first season. So we've I'm, we've. I'm definitely a fan. We're holding like, the torch. I thank loved you. the first season of House of Dragons. Oh, it's, thank you. In a way, it's like 1980s 
D and D fantasy adventures put on screen. You know, it's Love that it. sort I'll of really that. sometimes really crazy stuff that happens. That and dragons. You can't go yeah. wrong with dragons. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, they yeah, do I'm looking forward out. to season two. Oh, good. But hopefully, too, it means that uh, you know. I guess as as you go through time, I don't know how much time the whole series could span, but you'll have new people, new swords, so maybe some ex reasons for having some more uh, cool hero swords. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no. As as the as the war gets uh, goes on and on, more of uh, these kind of named. Uh, Valyrian steel swords come into the mix because the mm -hmm. you know the the houses that yeah. have these great artifacts you know come onto the battlefield and some of them get lost or end up getting picked up by somebody else when the yeah. owner dies and falls in battle. Uh, so you will be seeing some more uh, some more glorious Valyrian steel in the uh, in the future. Um, Peter, this was uh, really yeah, this amazing. Was great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. We usually play a little game at the end of end of this. We've we've as you can imagine on this podcast with with at least one uh, host being obsessed with swords. We have talked about a lot of sword movies. So uh, usually we, 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 we bring up a movie and we say, if you could keep anything from it, what, what would it be? I think we should yeah. play a sword game, but I think we, we'll put I parameters wrote, around I it. wrote two jokes. I want to, Peter, okay. pick, a, pick your favorite joke, but okay. they're not okay. real questions. Joke one is, what's your favorite gun in a movie? That's, that's, that's <laughs> okay. joke version one. <laughs> okay. And then joke yep. version two is, what's your favorite sword in the Amazon Lord of the Rings TV show. Anyway, <laughs> okay. you don't have to. You don't have to comment. You can just. You can smile pleasantly. Okay. And we'll um, yeah. Okay. In terms of the gun, in terms of the gun, I think it's got to be Hellboy's gun. Oh wow! Very okay. Good. Very good. Well, Excellent. I, mean, I mean, because in most movies, a gun is a gun, but Hellboy's gun is, you know, unique. There are some cool swords in The One Ring that, yeah. <laughs> But I'm not. I, I've got to admit, I'm not sure which one I'd want to keep because I would, given a choice, I would always go back to Lord of the Rings and keep one of those sure. swords. I think that's saying a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Without saying anything. So yeah. What yeah. was your real but, question, Ryan? Did you have a real question? I'm well, sorry. I was I, just. I, I mean, yes. I mean, those are those are very good. I like the gun game. I think we should. No. Well, I like the gun game. Do you, I, I have a gun I actually yeah. like from a movie okay. that isn't necessarily the greatest movie, but I have a soft spot for it. I enjoy that stupid Constantine movie with Keanu oh, okay. Reeves, and I yep. sort of like that crazy rifle that they made in that. Mm -hmm. That uh, I don't know. It just it's a fun sort of. I don't know. It's a prop that fits into that world, even though none of that stuff was really in the comic books. But I I, I have yep. a soft spot for that. Mm -hmm. So there's one for me. But I do love the Hellboy gun a lot. Yeah. Uh, I'm very torn because I I also love movie guns as well as movie swords. Um, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go for one that we haven't really talked about uh, on the podcast. We've talked about a bunch of these things before, and I'm I'm a bit torn as to my favorite movie design ever. But this is one that is ha I've always loved because of its practicality. And we've talked a lot about practicality today, and that is basically I, I think kind of lost because nobody nobody's ever seen the hero, and that's uh, RoboCop's Auto Nine from the original RoboCop oh, movie. Okay. And I love that design. Auto knife. I'm sorry. Uh, Robocop had a knife? No, no, the Auto 9. It's, it's the name oh, of the, the gun. Oh, they, they, oh right. I, oh, I think his it's machine just, pistol. Yeah, it's an automatic 9 yeah. millimeter, And yeah. it was based on a Beretta 93R, which is like the you know full auto pistol. Mm. And it, they, yeah. they built a bunch of stuff onto it. But I love how practical it looks, where it looks like a real gun. Yeah. And I love how they built it to kind of be holstered inside of his, you know, inside of his yeah. leg. Yeah, and uh, yet it's cool. it's an it's still an iconic movie design, and I just mm -hmm. I, that scene when you know when everybody's at the shooting range and they just hear the yeah. they hear oh, the yeah. report Brat, from the automatic Brat, going, Brat. Right. yeah yeah yeah, yep. it's just it's 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 great. Where is that gun? If you know, please write the podcast. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, no yeah. idea. Yeah, <laughs> we would like um, that gun. Maybe they yeah. took the bits off and resold it. Who knows? Yeah, um, I mean it's entirely. Like, so it was also or, an automatic, or it, or, or it pistol. could be like. Um, yeah, you, know, you like you know what happens to most film props is they go into a store, a warehouse like you know that warehouse at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's where film props go to die, I guess. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we need we need more of those warehouses to be opened up so that we can. We go keep hoping. Uh, you, I, I, this is not for you, Peter, to make a comment on, but you know the rumor has always been that someday, perhaps, that uh, Peter Jackson would sort of turn everything into a museum that you could buy a ticket to. I guess oh. that's my. That's I'd love to go to that museum. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. like, when it traveled, it traveled, you know, years ago when the Lord of the Rings mm. films came through, oh, yeah. the, the, the stuff traveled, which was fantastic. Yeah. 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 And it was hugely popular. Yeah, yeah I um, saw it. Yeah, I, I would love to Boston. see his collection in a 
in a museum, not just yeah. Lord of the Rings, but everything else. He's he doesn't just collect stuff from his movies either. He's a huge collector of all sorts of stuff. And so yeah, it would be an amazing museum. And you know, there have been a several aborted attempts to get it off the ground, but who knows what might be possible. Like if I know you anything, know I can't possibly say right. you anything know what more. might <laughs> help him get the museum going is if he did a public uh, appearance on the mm. Stuff Dreams Are Made of podcast. That's to right. Kind yeah. of talk about the museum. Mm -hmm. I, that's just a, I'm just saying. I think that yep. could really help. That could well, really help I think if I think if uh, this sh gets shared around the halls of Weta, which I think it's going to, because I think mm -hmm. uh, Weta's Weta's public relations oh. team took a bit of an interest in this. Maybe maybe we can get maybe we can build our way up. Maybe we could have yeah. you know Richard Taylor come on and talk to us, and then one day. Yep. maybe well, you know mr jackson himself yep S send me the link when uh, you've got it all prepared and and i'll see what's possible <laughs> we will we we would love yeah. that we would love that uh, on that fine note peter thank you so much this yep. was just yeah, fantastic thank you, thank you for taking really the time really enjoyable yeah, you're yeah. welcome hey just before we go yeah um, i know i mentioned this right at the beginning that but i was hoping to talk a little bit about uh something i've noticed particularly through my facebook friends who are often knife makers, sword makers and armorers and and like as somebody who is almost certainly autistic myself, I've noticed that there's a lot of people struggling with life these days. Hmm. Post COVID in particular. But like um and it sort of is something that you probably have seen yourself, Ryan, is that you know the people that are what you'd call in the artistic sphere are okay, we're not normal, to put it politely, as a group. Like if we were normal people, we wouldn't be doing this, would we? I don't think. Yes, correct. Yeah. And so um, I see a lot of the struggles that I've faced over the years, people posting stuff online. And I'm like, yeah, I've run into that myself. And I just want to essentially make a shout out to people that are struggling with things like autism, ADHD, imposter syndrome, stress and depression. Like I've been through all of that myself to some degree over the years and and like i've been lucky that i've also even while all that was happening i've been backstopped by steady work that's uh at least taken the financial stress off me and um but yeah i see a lot of people out there struggling and ai art if you want to call it that is just another thing that's happening now right that's uh putting more stress on artistic people and so I just want them to know that, like, yeah, you're not alone in your struggles and that, um, uh, like, a lot of us are going through stuff like this. I don't know what the answer is. There may not be an answer, but, uh, yeah, if you ever feel that you're alone, you're not really. And maybe reaching out to other people through Facebook or other social media might actually um, just, you know, support people who feel that they're they're just alone. Uh, thank you. That's uh, I think that's a great message. And I think I think that's something that a lot of people probably do need to hear. And I, you know, I know that yeah. in a small way, this podcast, because we are, this is a very niche interest that people tend to, you know, be very kind of obs obsessive and specific about. Um, a lot of people listen to this that uh, come from different walks, people that work in the film industry, as we were talking about offline before we, we got on the air, the film business has been through some real trials and tribulations, uh, you know, over the last uh, three or four years. And, um, you know, I think, I think, people, particularly artists that have worked in that have struggled. Um, and I think it's just, it's good to hear those sorts of things. And, you know, brighter days are ahead. I think, yeah. you know, the entertainment will kind of live yeah. on. We will, whatever form it comes in, I think we will continue to make it. But um, but I think that's it. We're, this is always a collective of artists getting together. And uh, we're all a bunch, you know, as you said, we're all a bunch of weirdos that <laughs> chose a different path. And uh, wh whoever we are, and um, I think it's really cool that we all kind of you know can get together in forums like this and uh, and nerd out and talk about the things that interest us. Well, thank you, Peter. We will uh, be back next week as we always are. Um, we can uh, you can find us on social media at Props Podcast. Peter, can they find you anywhere? And, and uh, other um, than I have at a website. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm I haven't actually checked the Weta website for a long time to see whether I'm still actually you know, mentioned on there but I have a website not surprisingly it's called swords.co.nz uh, <laughs> excellent it's, it's, uh, it hasn't been updated for several years I didn't see much point when I wasn't taking on work but I'm planning to update that in the next several months and well 
there you go. Join us next week and uh, subscribe, download, and tell your friends. We will be back on Stuff Dreams Are Made Of. Thank you.